Okay, um, thank you very much uh, for the introduction and <clears throat> for inviting me to this uh, beautiful event. Very happy to be here in presence. So I uh, would like to report on uh, work uh, from my group, uh, mainly done by uh, Björn Ladewig and Thomas Müller, PhD students, and uh, senior postdoc uh, Michael Buchholt. So we had already beautiful introductions, uh, so I can be really, really brief and quick. But uh, just as a reminder, there's two fundamentally distinct forms of quantum dynamics, namely, and, and usually we think about this in small quantum systems, namely there's deterministic Schrödinger evolution and then there's stochastic state updates done by measurements. And this situation becomes particularly interesting when um, the uh, Hamiltonian operator generating the deterministic dynamics and the measurement operators do not commute. If you think of such circumstance in a many-body context, yeah, now it's easy to imagine that there should be really quantum phase transitions driven by the competition of these uh, incompatible operators. And the question is then, of course, how can one see that? And that was really pioneered in, um, in these uh, two ground-laying works here. The picture is really simple. If you have Hamilton dynamics, it will lead to entanglement growth. And if you have then, if you make, put this in competition with uh, local measurements, you should see entanglement saturation. And in fact, these works here have really shown that at a finite uh, competition rate of the number of measurements per unit time versus number of unitaries per unit time, there is a transition. And uh, there's in the meantime two uh, well-studied classes. So this uh, first class where this, uh, both are in this uh, Gaussian kind of polynomial complexity class, and the random Clifford circuits here, they show a volume to area law entanglement transition. And uh, I mean, admittedly, much less <laughs> prominent class are maybe these three fermions here, which show a little bit a different kind of entanglement transition, namely from a critical log scaling phase into, uh, again, an area law. Now, what I would like to discuss today is concerns uh, this class of systems, and we are focusing on Hamiltonian dynamics, which is in the class of free Hamiltonians. So we will look at kinetic energy. This can be in the case where the hopping is just near its neighbor, but we'll also look at kind of larger hops, long range hopping systems. And the competition that we, that we put into the problem is to monitor the system locally, to measure the local density of this, or to monitor this, this density locally, which, and then you have a competition between the delocalization tendency of kinetic energy and the localization tendency of the measurements. And we'll also um, put this into competition with unwanted, somehow in your NISC device, unwanted uh, perturbations like um, decoherence channels. And uh, so I would like to report you on the kinds of entanglement transitions that are available in this framework. I'll also tell you how one can look at these problems from, a, from an analytical point of view. And, and as an outlook, I would like to touch on some preliminary work on um, actually observing these transitions and making it visible. Okay, so here is the setup of our problem. We look in, um, at what is known as weak measurements, not the projective ones. And the weak measurements, they are um, uh, described here by a stochastic wave function update here, which is done by the coherent evolution piece. And then you have here the effect of measurements, yeah? so local monitoring of density as uh, shown here. And you see very explicitly the stochastic nature of this, um, of this up state update here by a Gaussian random variable involved. Now, um, as we've already seen, yeah? so the wave function is then a random object. And in fact, if you average over all the measurement outcomes, or in our case, over the stochastic noise, then it, the state looks really like a unit matrix, like an infinite temperature state. And it's also easily seen by mapping this problem to an associated Lindblad equation, just averaging over the stochastic noise or over the, uh, the proxies for the measurement outcomes. Now, uh, the fix for that is to more generally look at quantities which evade this uh, linear averaging death somehow namely to look at nonlinear, at state-dependent observables, if you like. And beautiful example for that is, of course, the von Neumann entanglement entropy, which really has arbitrary powers 
it involves arbitrary powers of this state projector, yeah, so that we already introduced up there. But you can also be a bit more modest and just look at something that is quadratic in this projector. Yeah? So each of these angular brackets here stands for the trace over one realization of this state projector here. Okay, and um, just uh, now for the case of this nearest neighbor hopping, so the simplest situation, then we obtain a phase diagram of this type here. So on this axis, you see the competition between measurement and hopping. Yeah? So, and uh, in particular, if we really go to the thermodynamic limit, very large systems here, then you find here in the asymptotic um, system size limit, you find a log scaling of the entanglement entropy which is actually not smoothly connected to the single point yeah, where, of the unmeasured point where there's a volume law in this dynamics. And then there is also a, a phase transition in this problem which goes into an area law phase. Now the um, uh, observables, quote unquote, uh, for, for this transition are uh, obtained as this. Yeah? You can, for example, fit, just uh, try, fit this um, um, formula here for the scaling of the entanglement entropy taken from the literature on conformal field theories and, and track the change of this gamma uh, central charge, effective central charge parameter. This does an abrupt jump at some fixed uh, gamma, 0.42 something, um, which is kind of reminiscent already of a BKT transition and we'll see this relation later on. Now, um, there's also, I mean, information on this uh, um, transition really in this much simpler object, at least from a theory point of view, yeah, which is just quadratic in the state projector. And um, this shows here um, 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 algebraic scaling in the weakly measured phase and uh, um, exponential decay in the strongly measured. And this, this function here, yeah, so this density-density uh, two-point function will be very important later on too. Also in the, in the mutual information that uh, Matthew Fischer pointed at, there, there is, um, in our case, uh, signatures of emergent conformal invariance, not only at, at the critical point, but in fact, uh, rather at the, in, in the entire uh, critical phase of this problem. Okay, now how to um, understand this problem here? And um, I think it's, it's very useful to, to go from a simple case, uh, which is easy to, to understand, namely a single fermion hopping over two sides with some strength j and being then monitored where it is. So um, this is equivalent to a monitor two-state system. And um, you can see here quali strong qualitative differences yeah, in the physics at strong monitoring. The system is essentially pinned to the eigenstates of the measurement operators all the time yeah, up to these very rapid instanton-like excursions here. It's really in either zero or one, so close to the eigenstates of the number operator, while at weak monitoring, you essentially see Rabi oscillations, yeah, which are governed by, by this hopping here. And the system, as you can see, essentially spends vanishing time in the eigenstates of the measurement operators. Now, as promised, yeah, nothing is visible in the linear averages of this, um, of this problem. But if you go, for example, to this baby version of density-density correlations, at least you see some life going on. Yeah? And uh, this guides the approach to the theoretical approach. Yeah? In fact, if we now morph this system to a thermodynamic limit, it's plausible yeah, that a strong, uh, that really a singular non-analytic point develops which corresponds to a phase transition. And uh, it should be signaled also in these state-dependent observables like this density-density correlator. And to this end, we um, have a replica construction to be able to simply describe this. And the main result from this is that indeed there is a kind of pinning transition in which degrees of freedom, in the replica degrees of freedom, uh, uh, in, uh, which is actually in the BKT universality class. Okay, so here is the setup of the problem. We have a fermion and a boson variant. We go to a continuum limit for this problem. So in the continuum limit, so you may think of it as a continuum limit of the lattice fermions. So we get a Dirac Hamiltonian for left and right moving fermions. And this can be bosonized into um, a Lattinger liquid with phase and density fluctuations. The measurement operators, they um, can they, they come down to current and vertex operators, which then bosonize to something which is still um, linear in the, in the density fluctuations here, but also a piece which is really nonlinear. 
in the, in the density fluctuations. And these measurement operators, they preserve the properties of having local number, eigenstate, local number states as, as eigenstates here in this condition. And um, still, of course, we have the competition, uh, which comes from the non-commutativity of this phase term and this cosine nonlinearity. Okay, now for these replicas, so how can we capture the information of this um, uh, correlation function here? We just copy the Hilbert space twice, and we then look at the state um, matrix of, of, of this copied Hilbert space here, and all the information that, that we want to extract here in terms of um, co quadratic correlations here are now then hosted in the linear average of this extended um, replicated Hilbert space um, density matrix. And we then need to find an evolution equation. So what's the state update on this object here? And it's actually, some things are familiar. So they look, they look like two copies of um, uh, heating Lindbladians yeah, with this noise uh, density measurement operators here. But then there's also an interesting coupling between these replicas. And the question is now, what's the right degrees of freedom in this problem? And it turns out actually that there is a proper choice of degrees of freedom which is exact if the theory is Gaussian and very useful otherwise when we want to expand about a Gaussian state. And uh, these are actually the average coordinate, yeah, so sum over these replicas and these relative replica fluctuations. And you can then formulate equations of motion now for this new degrees of freedom and you see then the clear structure, this average coordinate just heats up all the time. It gets all the noise in the problem while the relative coordinate cools down into some kind of dark state. Yeah? And because of this decoupling, at least on the level of linear theories yeah, and, and approximate otherwise, um, we can formulate an effective non-Hermitian Schrödinger equation, yeah, which is governed by this Hamiltonian here. And you recognize here the Lattinger liquid for the Hamiltonian. This is the term from one of these measurement operator pieces. And then there's also this measurement nonlinearity present. So we can extract the physics by putting this here in a path integral um, framework. And then the relevant thing to analyze is this non-Hermitian sine Gordon action, which, um, which we analyze with flow equations. Yeah? So we study the flow of these coupling parameters here, k and lambda. And at short distances, yeah, so this is a non-Hermitian sine Gordon model, the flow is really somehow different from the standard case, but that just shifts around the phase border. The important point is that at long distances, really, this collapses to the standard BKT flow equations. So we expect then the same long wavelength properties. And that constructs then a phase diagram here, where we have a phase with an algebraic decay, which is somehow depinned. We have a phase with an exponential decay. That's the, the phase of, the, of this non-emission sine Gordon model where mass is generated. So that causes an exponential decay. And then there is also a critical point, which is in the BKT universality class, and that's actually really nicely confirmed in the, in the numerical numerics, yeah, where we apply essentially the uh, collapse techniques of the BKT problem. Okay, now also for computing the entanglement entropies, we need more than two replicas. We actually need n of them because we need all the Rennie entropies to finally take this uh, limit n to one. And, um, this also gives nice insights in the workings of this, this formulation here. And, and this is a statement now in the, um, in the cases where we are at a Gaussian fixed point of this theory, either massless or, or gapped, as I said. And in these cases, yeah, we can really exactly, again, decouple a center of mass degree of freedom, which gets all the noise. Yeah? So if you go to a reciprocal space here, you can see one degree of freedom gets it all all the noise, as previously these average coordinates, and all the other n minus one modes, they are completely noiseless. And so they are completely decoupled from the noise, and nicely, only those guys here really contribute to the calculation of the entropy. And that means, yeah, so that, that shows that, that in, uh, when we compute the entropy in this close to the limiting cases here, then we get this log uh, behavior, and here we get an area law behavior. Okay, now let's look at um, longer range models and again, compare a bit uh, and numerics and analytics for this problem. So here, I'm sorry, Mr. Bach, can yeah. I make a simple sort of an HBA yeah. Yeah. 
<laughs> no, but I think, I mean, actually, <laughs> Ehud's, Ehud's uh, technique gives a nice, a nice way of looking at it, at least, yeah? by, by, I mean, looking at the free fermion point where you could do really exact calculations and, and looking just at the effect of a single measurement uh, update on, say, a ground state wave function, yeah? so that we can take from your papers. <laughs> Yeah, so, so and see how whether whether just for this little update there is already a downshift in this in this C of gamma. Yeah? So that I think is a very interesting thing, what we done. Yeah? But no fundamental reason seen. Yeah? Okay, good. Um, so uh, now this long range model here. Uh, so we have this parameter, this range parameter. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Right, right, right. I mean, there is a high level argument. I mean, this, this is kind of operator transformations yeah, between bosons and fermions, but fine. I think, I mean, in the end, yeah. I, I, I see the point with the Fermi surface. Yeah? So, but I mean, I think um, we are somehow helped a bit by the structure of the problem. Yeah? So, I think this expansion is okay yeah, if you are close to, uh, to the unmeasured case. Yeah, where we have a really a gapless uh, theory. I mean, the Lattinger liquid is also a hydrodynamic description for the density fluctuations. Yeah? And we're exp so that's how I can also look at that, yeah, not in terms of fundamental fermions. So it's really the conservation law of density that justifies uh, somehow that we write a Lattinger liquid there. And then we expose this to measurements. Yeah? And okay, th and then okay, th there's a bosonization argument again, but. It, it gives this kind of cosine nonlinearity if you do it systematically. And then we are essentially looking for the, the mass generation that is usual in this, uh, that, that is the effect yeah, that drives any kind of PKT transition. So we, we, are start, we, we cannot, from this theory, we cannot really penetrate. Um, I mean, we can then say, okay, mass is generated, so then this corresponds to another Gaussian fixed point of the theory, a massive Gaussian fixed point, and then we can do calculations for that. But what I really would, would, and I mean, you can see it also in the results here, yeah, so that <laughs> it fits uh, very well, yeah, even this fully bosonized theory as a final argument. <laughs> well, actually, no, yeah. because, for example, if I add fractions, American fractions, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. then you think that it will yeah. go to volume of a, well, Well, that, that's maybe not also not completely obvious. I mean, if it's, it could be a question of integrability versus, no, 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 uh, not yeah. Integrable. So you want to look at uh, generic non-integrable yeah, systems? Yeah, yeah. And yeah. Yeah. Yeah, nee, nee, nee. But I mean, all, I mean, it's well conceivable that this is also described. Yeah? So this would be described by the effect of, of thermalization. So generation of an intra-replica coupling. So this is an effect, yeah? so it's no problem to, to get a volume law out of a Lattinger liquid if you uh, evaluate the Lattinger liquid in, in, in a finite temperature state. Yeah? So then you get a, a, a linear L divergence instead of a log L. Yeah? So in the moment that we would have a mechanism that couples intra-replica the two contours, yeah? that would be a volume law. And that would be the expected effect that you have always in thermalization. Yeah? But um, <laughs> I mean, maybe I should move on or? Okay, so um, this, uh, okay, so now we're coming to this range. Yeah? So nearest neighbor hopping is, is down here on this axis. Yeah? So one over P is very small here. And for large um, one over P, we are in this long range regime. And it's limited by one so that, um, so that the, um, the, the Hamiltonian is still, uh, the energy is still extensive, yeah, super extensive. Okay. Right, and what we find here is actually a pinning of phase fluctuations and there, thereby, I mean, enhanced density fluctuations and the critical point at this strength P equals three halves. And um, so now if you um, look at it's where, where, where does this come from or what's the signatures for that? So, in, so if we do a cut along this line here or a cut along this line, when we cross this 
three half point here, then we see a smaller exponent in the density fluctuations, meaning that they are extended farther out in space, or enhanced density fluctuations. And the characteristics in terms of entanglement of this new phase here is actually a sub-volume law growth of the entanglement entropy yeah, with an exponent p. And all these findings, so the data points are these, yeah, and the, the dashed curves are really the analytic predictions from this Keldish field theory. It, it really nicely predicts, yeah, so this point uh, p equals three halves. And all this physics here is, although we are really using this bosonization here, and um, so it's all encoded essentially in this non-Hermitian long-range Hamiltonian here with this uh, cosine uh, piece here where maybe an interesting point to note is that this factor 2p here makes a clear-cut numerical difference or, or quant qual quantitative difference between a Hamiltonian which is processed without taking the noise into account and taking actually the effects of this measurement noise into account. If we would neglect this effect, yeah, then this exponent would actually be p, and that would be really strongly incompatible with these numerical findings also. Yeah? So I think here, I mean, the, the, the difference between this theory that we are looking here and these no-click evolutions is really kind of that, that these no-click evolutions, they look at rare trajectories, yeah, while this here looks more at, at something like typical trajectories. Yeah? So the effect of noise is really crucial here even quantitatively, also an effect that Ehud has seen with this change of the k K parameter. Okay, I think in time, how much? Five minutes? Okay, so maybe I, I spend actually more time on, on this stuff here. Um, so how we could um, observe this transition. Yeah? So there is, um, I mean, we um, think of a feedback scenario. I mean, in light of what we've heard, yeah, post-selection is exponentially hard, except um, for clever tricks here. So what we want to do is rather pre-selection. Yeah? So we will only allow states that, that we like somehow, that have characteristic properties. And uh, in a sense, we will break the degeneracy of the measurement outcomes, yeah? which is really the source of this huge configurational entropy that masks all this interesting physics. And we'll actually steer the system into a representative state in Hilbert space, a, a kind of dark state. Yeah? And in this way, what happens is that this transition becomes pulled to the level of standard quantum mechanical observables, linear in the state. There's then order parameters for this transition and everything. Okay, and here is the feedback procedure. So we have to track the measurement outcomes. So that is like a homodyne current that is tracked here. And then we condition the Hamiltonian on the outcomes yeah, in the Hamiltonian is very simple. Now back to nearest neighbor hopping. So we have this hopping matrix elements here. And now how do we have to choose the condition here? Well, we choose it such that there is actually for the global uh, generator of dynamics, including Hamiltonian and measurements, that there is really a common dark state. Yeah? A common state when you evaluate the Hamiltonian on it or the measurement operators on it, it really evaluates to zero. And this state is then chosen as one possible representative measurement outcome, namely, for example, for half-filled fermions here, this charge density wave state. So um, at strong monitoring, and then what happens qualitatively when we subject the system to this modified dynamics, at strong monitoring, the evolution will really be directed, the system will find this dark state, will be directed towards it, and at weak monitoring, the steering procedure simply fails. Yeah? So it's a kind of failure of a steering, and it's actually precisely the physics that is known in absorbing state transitions. Yeah? So there's always this dark state around, but some, in, in, if, if the competition is too strong, if the Hamiltonian is too strong, it just glosses over and, and misses it. Now, what's the results for this, yeah, the phenomenology of this um, transition here? So first of all, when we look at so the standard observables in this um, measurement-induced transition, then uh, we see it's really all the same, deep in the phases at least. Yeah? So we have an entanglement scaling, again, at weak monitoring, which is logarithmic here, and it saturates down here at strong monitoring and all the other stuff is, is the same, really. And, but now, 
due to this active steering, active feedback of the system, the transition becomes now really visible in ordinary quantum mechanical observables, yeah? so which are linear in the, linear in the state. And, and that is, um, I mean, the way of plotting is maybe not, not, not optimal, but what this here is kind of a charge density wave order parameter, which is zero when the charge density wave is taken, yeah? so we should have normalized it differently. But you see here at strong measurement, yeah, the system on polynomial time scales finds this charge density wave, while at two at weak monitoring only, yeah, the system just runs over it, and only at exponentially large times um, it falls into this into this dark state. And that's again like a rare event. Yeah, so that's also what you have in absorbing state transitions. There's always a rare event where you collapse in the dark state, even if or in this absorbing state, even if uh, even if you uh, have, uh, so to say, dominant, um, so to say, Hamiltonian dynamics, which doesn't like this dark state. Okay, and now to, to summarize these two things together here, so here is again a plot of the behavior of the entanglement entropy here as a function of the measurement strength, and here is a plot of this order parameter and with this un 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 not so nice normalization. So when there's absolutely no charge density wave, this thing here takes the value 0 0.25, and when there is a charge density wave, this converges to zero. Yeah? And you can really see that, at least here, this transition point here is really, come on, numerical, numerical precision, yeah, looks really like the same point. Yeah? This is the free fermions with this, uh, with this kind of modified state, state update. Yeah? And uh, there is also a story about non-free fermions, but that's a, uh, which I can comment on if you like. Yeah? More, more generic thing, yeah, so. Okay, and, and actually, yeah, so with this, yeah, when, when the system then builds up its nice order parameter, that, that will be now then really visible as in any quantum system. Yeah, you can, I mean, they're self-averaging and order parameters, they can be detected in a single shot yeah, for the system. Yeah, so because they are really macroscopically occupied um, uh, mode in the system, which you can study as, as a Bose-Einstein condensate, say. Okay, so that's it. I mean, I um, uh, explained a variety of measurement-induced phase transitions. Now, I missed a bit on this robustness question, maybe as a last point. I mean, also, like, like others, also Matthew Fischer and Altman also looked at this decoherence dynamics, and they found that there is a finite stiffness against, um, against um, decoherence or, or imperfect measurements. So that's also, even in our gapless problem, seems to be the case. Then here is a phase where, where correlation functions still behave algebraically, but uh, the state is extremely strongly mixed, uh, and then this is the fate of this, uh, this uh, area law phase here. It's, it's again, it persists up to, I mean, if, if measurements dominate over decoherence, uh, the state remains pure. And as, as directions, uh, I uh, put them up here. So with this, I think I thank you for your attention and uh, looking forward to questions.